Thank you. Thank you for being here, first of all. I really, hats off to you. You know, taking that step of empowering yourself actually could save your life or save a family member's life. This is actually a very, very important talk uh, from that perspective. Um, I love the poster here because it actually, in some sense to me, the, the bottom four symbols represents or symbolizes what I call complete cancer care or integrative medicine, which is getting the best from the medical system and then tapping into the resources within the community, such as PALS, which is a fantastic organization. And lastly, what you can do to empower yourself. It's that marriage that really can make a difference there. So I'm really excited to give this talk and um, quite happy to be here in beautiful Bermuda. <coughs> What I've noticed over the years is that people that I've served on the day-to-day -day want three things, essentially. One, they want to be cured of their cancer, and if that's not possible, they want to live for a long time with you know, great quality of life. They want to feel better, because kind of, there's so much stress and emotion, they want to kind of come home, get back into their own shoes. And lastly, in the last few years, people have been talking about kind of brain fog, being able to think more clearly, to have better function within their body and so on. And I want to cover all those bases in this talk. But I also realize that are, there are some people who don't have a cancer diagnosis and they have kind of certain wishes and hopes as well. And so for instance, they don't want to get cancer. Uh, and if there's a cancer diagnosis, you want to be able to pick it up early so that you have a higher chance of cure and um, you know, minimizes the amount of treatment. So that's kind of the screening part. And ultimately, if you do get a cancer diagnosis, I want you to have the information and insight and attitude that will give you the best chance of cure and getting the best care possible. And that you can share this information with a loved one if ever that loved one gets a cancer diagnosis. So this is for all of us. That's the takeaway point here. So this is what I'm going to talk about. Um, right from talking about cancer to right through what the treatments are and how to work with some of the emotions, talking about the family members, and ultimately we'll finish with a little prevention question. So right now, of all Bermudians, what's your risk of developing a significant cancer diagnosis in your lifetime? So if, you, if you haven't had it, what's your lifetime risk? You have cancer, says the doctor. Do you know what the number is? Yeah, it's about 40%. Yeah, so it's high, right? If you're a woman, what's the chance you get a breast cancer diagnosis in your lifetime? You, you can say it again. One in eight. Yeah, one in eight is about right. One in nine is what I'm quoting, right? If you live that long, and you know, it's, it, it puts you at risk. The men actually, how about them? Are they higher risk or lower risk than women with breast cancer? Higher. higher. So it's more like one in seven-ish? Somewhere in there. How about the colon cancer risk? Do you know what the numbers are? It's high as well. It's one in 14. And this is a, you know, you pick that one up early, you can be cured of your cancer. Really important. The mortality rates are going down when we do the actual screening there. Um, what's your chance of dying of cancer? I guess it's there already. A 30% risk of dying of cancer. Right? So it's, it's a real issue. Um, can I ask a question? Sure. I don't know what to say. When you say 30% risk, does that mean that 30% of Bermuda people will die of cancer? Die of cancer. Yes. That yeah, that's what it means. Cancer. It is. It's scary. I mean, we have to die of something, right? It's really the bottom line. Yeah. So this is a scary statistic for certain. And what I'm hoping is that if you get a cancer diagnosis, that you'll be cured of that first one. It can live for a long time. Maybe get a second one later in life. but hopefully be well and get great care for any situation. So if we figure out the statistics, it's very actually close to the United States in terms of incidence overall. And you'll see at the bottom of the screen there is breast cancers, um, about a quarter of all diagnoses. Prostate cancer is up there as well. There's slightly higher skin cancer rates in Bermuda, uh, slightly higher breast cancer rates as well. But essentially it's very similar distribution to uh, the states. It also means that 2,500 of the people that are walking around on the streets every day that you pump into here in Bermuda have had a cancer diagnosis, right? So it's a lot of people, yeah. And as the population gets older, the actually the incidence or the number of cases per year is actually going to keep going up. So it's, it's really, we're into this kind of epidemic of, of cancer. So it's significant and so therefore I want to empower you with the knowledge and insight 
around this. Uh, so to understand will put you in better control or feeling of being in more control, help you understand why we're doing the treatments that we're doing, you get better care from the medical system ultimately. And this is what I'm going to talk about, essentially all these ideas, right from screening to how the various treatments do their jobs. So cancer occurs when there are normal cells within the body that begin to grow in an uncontrolled way. Many, many different types of cancer, they're usually named after the body part where they started, except maybe the blood cancers, for instance. So for instance, uh, someone who has a breast cancer diagnosis, it gets into the bloodstream, lands on a bone, starts growing on a bone, it's still breast cancer, but it's metastasized to the bone. Each person's cancer is different. You really can't compare yourself with anybody else. So we start out with the idea that we're made up trillions of cells, that each cell has its own job. So for instance, we're shedding and creating new skin cells all the time. So that's kind of an ongoing turnover of those cells. The other cells that I want to tell you about just briefly, so red cells deliver the oxygen to the body, the white cells help fight off infection, platelets help the blood clot. I tell you that because if you're going through chemotherapy and those cells are low, then you'll have problems in those realms. Most of the cells within your body are actually quiet and not turning over, not generating new cells all the time. Uh, and the cells actually work as a team. They communicate with each other and they listen to each other's signals. The cells themselves are made up of um, a nucleus, which is simply called the, the brain of the cell, and then within the nucleus is the DNA, which are the words and sentences that you know, tell the cell how to do its job. It's the instruction manual, so to speak. And those cells are passing on that information to the next generation of cells. So you have those skin cells that are continuing to be sloughing and new cells are being uh, formed. Um, and so you start out with a parent cell up top, and they divide and they become two daughter cells with the same kind of information. Um, so the new cells are exactly the same essentially as the, uh, as the parents, unless there's been a mistake. So it's the same book of instructions. And typically, you know, you're growing your skin at the same rate, so the number of cells that are dying are equal to the number of cells that are being made. Sometimes we need to grow faster, we need to respond to a situation. But it's always under kind of a tight control. It's, it's, it's working at the pace that it should be. And it always stops growing fast afterwards. And the best kind of example of this, I think, is thinking of getting a cut on your skin. So there's the skin cells here. There's a cut that happens. The skin cells at the base of the cut recognize that there's a problem. They begin to multiply very quickly. They, they continue to multiply and then when they realize that the skin is sealed over, they slow down again. So it goes from regular growth to super fast growth back to regular growth again. So it's all under control. They're, they're working together. What a cancer cell is a normal cell that has many mistakes in it. And their mistakes are created in three different ways. One is that you're born with a set of mistakes and that's actually pretty rare overall. It only counts for about 5%, 7% of all cancers. The second thing that happens is that mistake happens when the parent cell goes to the daughter cells. Um, and so that's what you call a mutation. And as the decades go by and the cells keep going, the probability that you kind of accumulate more and more mutations or changes gets higher and higher. And lastly, we cause damage to the cells that can be captured in the subsequent generations in lots of different ways. So the, like smoking, for instance, or the UV light and sunlight can cause melanoma. There are certain viruses, uh, like HPV for cervical cancer. Our fatty diets often cause these kind of um, damage and breakdown within the tissue. Obesity contributes to it. And so there are different ways that we cause kind of damage to the actual normal cells. And I'll give you an example of uh, a normal instruction. So typically, like in prostate cancer, if the, cancer, if the prostate cells, the normal cells are growing, and they're growing with time, and they run into the lining or the capsule of the prostate gland, that's a signal to them to stop growing. So that's the normal instruction from the cell. But if that's changed for some reason or other that says, oh, don't worry about that, just keep on growing and growing and growing, it's as if there's no break on that system. They, they've lost the breaks. The cell doesn't stop growing. Another example is, you can think of a cell as like a potato. 
and they have these little antenna on the outside edge. And that's a hormone receptor. And there's you know, molecules within the bloodstream and it lands on the hormone receptor. It can tell the cell to grow. So for instance, estrogen would tell the breast tissue to continue to grow, for instance. If there's a mistake, so that would be a normal scenario. If there's a mistake and it's changed to you know, grow no matter what kind of touches the, the antenna, then it's getting a signal to keep on turning over. The cells are growing and growing and growing because they're getting this message to keep on growing. So they keep on dividing. So why is it that we don't see more cancers? Because there's a system of repair there that's constantly cleaning up those mistakes. The mistakes might be hitting cells that aren't growing or turning over. Or it could be an unimportant word or sentence that gets knocked off for whatever reason. But once that mistake is captured in that next generation of cells, then that's, that mistake will keep getting handed on down further and further down the line. And the cells that are really at risk are the cells that keep growing, like the skin cells, for instance, or the lining of the throat or the lung cells, etc., colon cells. So what is cancer again? It's a normal cell that's begun to grow in a fast and uncontrolled way. It really does require dozens of mistakes before you change that normal cell into the cancer cell. And by definition, cancer can kind of penetrate or grow into the tissue. It doesn't get stopped at the barriers, it just keeps on growing. And the other things that cancer can do is it can get into the lymph system, which is a system of pulling the kind of water off the fluid that can go to the lymph nodes, or it can actually get into the bloodstream and kind of float around, kind of land at a different site. So that's the other possibility, that's called metastasis. So that by definition, so the ability to penetrate or the ability to spread and grow a colony elsewhere is a metastasis. I show you this diagram because the normal cell up top is something we have in our youth and then as the decades go by we keep accumulating more damage and some of those cells multiply and get more and more damage and more and more damage until we get into whatever age, you know, 40, 50, 60, 70, 80, where you've had enough damage that the cells are beginning to turn over and create multiple copies of themselves. A few definitions, precancerous uh, means there are changes to the cell but not enough to cause the cell to be called malignant or the you know, ability to penetrate or, or spread elsewhere, so precancerous. Benign typically means the cells are growing in that same spot and just kind of causing a lump that's pushing against the tissue but not penetrating through the tissue. A benign tumor in the middle of your brain can be very serious as well, but typically benign tumors are good, good, uh, a good situation. Takeaway is each person's cancer is different. Each person has a different set of mistakes in their cancer cells. Um, and therefore, it, each cancer has kind of a different personality. And so therefore, you can't compare yourself or your situation with anybody else. And also means that nobody can say absolutely what's going to happen in your situation because you can do better than that prediction. It's just an average when the doctors try to make that assessment. So we think about that kind of little collection of cancer cells beginning to grow, thinking one to two to eight to 16. So it's creating a lump, a kind of exponential growth. And yes, some of the cells are dying off at the same time, more cells are growing and so on. And typically it takes a tumor three, four, five months to double, like from one centimeter to two centimeters in size. And then that same amount of time to go from two centimeters to four centimeters. It's the same growth rate. And to think about it, the, the uh, cells are so incredibly tiny that a cubic centimeter, like the tip of my pinky here, has a billion cells in it. Just to give you an idea as to the, you know, why you might not be able to see a single cell in an x-ray, for instance. So if you have cancer cells in your bodies, how, do it, how does it cause problems? And so it can be at the primary site. So for instance, a lung cancer can grow and kind of block off an airway, or it could spread to lymph nodes at a region and cause that same kind of lump sensation. Or if it gets elsewhere in the body and um, causes lumps or pains or bleeding or presses against a nerve to cause the, the pain. Or if you get enough cancer in a certain organ, that organ won't function as well, for instance, a liver or a kidney. If there are enough cancer cells in your body, then you're going to spend your kind of life energy, your kind of food energy feeding the cancer, and so therefore people oftentimes feel fatigued. Or if it hits another system like the blood system, they can knock off some of those cells as well. The idea though is that cancer cells are fast-growing cells, and so we give treatments against 
those cells to kind of kill them and you know, neutralize them and knock them out. So that's the kind of general perspective on this. I'd also say that cancer cells are fragile in some sense. They've kind of mutated, become you know, far more abnormal. And it's only that kind of one in a thousand cells that has the capacity to keep on going and going and going. And if we can aim our treatment at that, those few cells, we can actually uh, do well. A tumor, that collection of cancer cells, can outstrip its own blood supply. And you simply, in order to get a shrinkage, you need more death happening than the um, um, growth. And the immunes in some, some cancers, for instance, this is a big white cell here recognizing the cancer cell as abnormal, can identify that as four and actually kill the cell. And that, that's not in every cancer, but there are some cancers where it does make a big difference. Okay, I'm not trying to scare you around the cancer situation because I will go into the treatment as well. But I want to go to the next step. So if you realize that there's that little collection of cancers, can we pick it up early enough that a simple surgery, for instance, would remove all the cancer cells from the body and the person would be fine. So this idea of screening. And so a screening test, uh, as defined in our cancer society in Canada, so it's a type of test in which you may feel fine, but there's still uh, you know, an abnormal growth there. And if you can pick it up before it actually causes you a problem, would be screening. If you have a particular symptom, that's not screening. You actually just have to go see your doctor and get that symptom taken care of. I'm showing you a curve of breast cancer here. You can see that uh, really from the ages of about 50 onwards, there's a real spike in the, uh, in the incidence of that. Now we're probably picking up earlier cancers because the mammograms are so good that we can pick these tumors up kind of a few years in advance. But essentially, age is the risk factor and being a woman is a risk factor for breast cancer. There are the other risk factors. I want you to, I mean, it's a very long list, but I'll just point out a few. So alcohol is known to increase risk, smoking, uh, lack of exercise, all these things that kind of change the kind of soup or chemicals in which the cancer cells can grow. Um, and then there's lots of kind of uh, genetic abnormalities as well. So we want to minimize the controllable risk factors. And I'd say between uh, exercise, a healthy diet, and maintaining a reasonable weight, we could decrease the breast cancer incidence by about 30%. One in three breast cancers could be prevented if we as a society did those things. Okay, so the recommendation. So if a woman is at risk, and all women are at risk, then I'd suggest at minimum it's a mammogram every two years from age 50. Uh, so even in, if you have a family history or other risk factors, it changes is really the, kind of the takeaway point. So 10 years younger than uh, the youngest person in your family get a cancer diagnosis. But there's also uh, yearly mammograms from age 40 is what we're seeing and what we're recommending in my province. Since 2003, the mortality rate from breast cancer in my province has dropped by 50%. And the reason being is that more, the screening mammograms are picking up these tiny tumors earlier and earlier. And that's what I'm seeing on my day to day. So please, for the women out there, get your mammogram. As well, I would suggest self-breast examination. You see a lump, feel a lump that's abnormal, please get it checked out. Uh, although I can't prove that to you that it makes a difference. So oftentimes when you get a mammogram, the professional will also uh, feel for uh, lumps there. So this is a mammogram. Essentially, what it's a picture. The breast is squeezed between the x-ray plates, and they take an x-ray that way, and then they squeeze it from up and down and take a second x-ray. And you can see the little uh, circle here, um, and then within the circle is this little bright spot, and so that's the abnormality. It can be just a few millimeters in size, and the, um, they would say that's abnormal, start a biopsy, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, I just want to touch base two more screening tests. So interestingly, the prostate cancer is also very similar incidence, right? So the damage is happening over those decades. You get enough incidence that it causes actually diagnosis. What percentage of 70-year-olds, 70-year-old men, have prostate cancer cells in their prostate? It's, yeah, 80, 80, 70, 80 percent. It's very, very high, right? And many, many, many of those aren't going to develop into significant cancers. Uh, and what you're probably seeing is uh, a spike there. Now the mortality rate from prostate cancer is actually going down, again because of screening. These are being picked up earlier on. 
Um, I am estimating 50 men in Bermuda will be diagnosed with prostate cancer this year. It's only about one in six that will actually die of cancer. And I'm hoping to keep you in the former category if you're a man out there. So 10% uh, so of all over deaths, but about 25% of all diagnoses in men. The PSA is a blood test. Essentially, P sorry, PSA is a chemical that's released into the bloodstream. And that chemical is produced from both the normal prostate cells and the cancer cells. And that's why it's a bit tricky because every man's going to have a certain level of PSA, but the higher the PSA, the higher the chance that there could be some cancer there. And if there's inflammation or infection within the prostate, uh, then that can falsely elevate the PSA and make it look like there's a problem uh, there. And that's why you know um, you get a little bit of balancing of the PSAs and much harder to interpret. My um, view around screening, now remember, screening is for uh, gentlemen that don't have a problem. They're not having problems with urination, they're not having pain or symptoms. Screening is for the guys that are feeling fine. So PSA, um, you know, get to see your doctor if you're having symptoms. I think from age 50, guys should be getting their PSA. If you have a you know, regional longevity in your family and you're planning to live for more than 10 years, I really think it's quite worthwhile to get the PSA blood test. Now, there's controversy around that, but what there's not controversy about is if a guy has a prostate cancer diagnosis, PSA is an excellent way to watch to see what would happen uh, over the years. Okay, lastly, um, the colorectal cancer. You're seeing the same pattern, right? The older people get, the higher they are at risk of developing new cancer. So again, from a 50, 60 years old, it's a higher rate of colon cancer. Um, I'm showing you two images there. So one is kind of a CAT scan. On this side, it's as if I've cut myself like this and then kind of peeled off my body and you're looking straight at me. So hips down here, and this is a dark area that has kind of a constriction. The dye isn't getting through there, so that looks like um, a, a polyp in the, in the colon, so that looks like a colon cancer. And this little gray dot over here is also uh, a lymph node, an involved lymph node. And then this is a picture actually putting a scope up the backside, right to the colon. On the bottom right here is the normal looking innards of the colon, what they call the mucosa. It's this area here that looks kind of more ugly and fungating that is the actual cancer itself. So that's what you would, that's what the doctor would see if they did a colonoscopy on, on that patient. Big slide, I just want you to maybe realize that, you know, I can't tell you exactly what your screening should be because it depends on your risk factors, but we can just look at this box here and that is, <coughs> if you're at average risk, then you probably need to either have uh, um, a stool sample sent every couple of years to see if there's any blood in the stool sample, or alternatively, they do like a colonoscopy where they actually stick a tube up and have a look probably every five to 10 years. So this will save lives. You really need to talk to your family physician or your surgeon about whether you need it and how often you should get this done. But I, I highly recommend that we not kind of shy away from colon cancer because you can change your outcome for that. Uh, just some quick, a quick one. Cervical cancer is the last uh, screen there. Should start from age 21. It stops according to kind of the risk, so it's at least till age 65. A women should have this probably pap test every three years. They also screen for a virus. The virus is a very much associated with a cancer. Women who've had their uterus out don't need to have that same screening. And even if you've had the vaccine, so now girls, kind of in, you know, teenage girls are getting this vaccine against the virus that kind of causes the cancer. But even with that vaccine, the women are at risk and still need that screening. Okay, on to just the medical system. So what happens when someone gets a cancer diagnosis and how can you empower yourself through this? So you get a diagnosis by either having symptoms, some problem, or a screening test says, uh oh, this looks bad, we gotta do something. And then the first step is actually get a piece of that cancer and look at it underneath the microscope. It's called a biopsy. And it proves it's cancer, tells the type of cancer, starts a process, of what we need to do next for that person. This is a slide of cancer cells. You can see the kind of black dots and 
whitish kind of areas are kind of very um, different from each other, what's called um, um, heterogeneous. So that's more typical of a cancer looking more aggressive. The cells are uh, not uh, working together. So then the next step is this idea of staging. How advanced is the cancer? Has the cancer spread somewhere else in the body? And we think about the site where it started. We think about the lymph nodes in that area. We think about the bloodstream. We think about is there spots in the liver, or the bone, etc. And if you can tell how far the cancer spread, it starts to answer that question of what's the best treatment in that circumstance? And what's the chance of cure? What's the likelihood of what's going to happen according to how advanced the cancer is? So that's called staging. Uh, it comes out as blood tests and uh, x-rays, looking at the function. A CAT scan is an x-ray that kind of slices you up like um, a loaf of bread. A bone scan, they inject something into the veins. It's a radioactive substance that goes to the bones, wherever the bones are turning over. Cancer cells are turning over a lot, and so they kind of light up. Some arthritis can light up a little bit as well. Uh, MRI scan is like a fancy CAT scan that gives you better res resolution. When they look at the cancer underneath the microscope, there's something called grade. The grade is how fast growing it looks. Is it really fast growing ugly like that picture I showed you, or is it very slow and controlled? And there are other ways to kind of assess how bad are those cancer cells. Do they have these little receptors on the outside edges? Are the words and sentences have bad genes in them? Uh, so it's just kind of figure out different ways, and that can also help us w tell us which treatment we should use. I'm, I'm showing a cross section of a bone. So let's say there's a bone here, and we're just kind of slicing it there, and you're looking end on. And if there's a single cancer cell, and remember, a billion cells within my pinky, tip of my pinky, the chance that a bone scan or a CAT scan or some other scan is actually going to show that tiny speck of a cell is extremely low. And I tell you that because you can go have a scan and the doctor can say that scan is normal, but it still could have some cancer cells in it, is really the, the takeaway. It's always probability. The physicians are trying to figure out what they're going to do for you, and they start answer, asking those questions. So what's the stage? How, you know, how far advanced is it? We break people up into essentially want to go for cure or we want to make them live for a long time, a non-curative side. What's the best treatment? Can the patient take the treatment that we're recommending? How fit are they overall? And you no, know, importantly, what does the person in front of me want? Uh, you know, do they want to go for an aggressive therapy? Are they willing to do chemotherapy or surgery or radiation? So the question is, can I be cured is the, one of the first things that people ask. To me, cured means that there are no cancer cells left over in the body after the treatment. And sometimes we use what we call adjuvant treatment. So for instance, a woman has a breast cancer, they do a surgery, they take out a lump of breast, uh, and then we don't know if there's any cancer cells left over. There's no 100% guarantee, and we add extra treatment, and the extra treatment can kill off cells that might be there. So the idea is we're increasing the probability of cure by giving these extra treatments. When I hear the word in remission, it sounds to me like there are some cancer cells left over, but they're going to grow back, but we just can't see them right now. And again, that's a non-curative pathway. We aim for longevity and quality of life. And overall, physicians just think about, is the benefit from the treatment outweighing the risk? Right? Are we adding to cure, therefore we're willing to you know, do it? Um, uh, you know, to what degree and what side effects? Or somebody with longevity, is the side effect worth the increase in, in the length of time that they would live? So you would know surgery. Surgery, you, you almost always looking at just one area. The issue is that you, with surgery, there's almost always an effect on the normal tissue as well. It's not like you can just kind of peel out a cancer. You actually have to take usually a rim of normal tissue. And if the surgeon says to you, you know, don't worry, 100% have you know, got it. So in some situations that may be true, but essentially after surgery there's always that chance, even if it's a tiny chance, that there could be some cells left behind or alternatively that the cancer spread elsewhere, depending on the, the type of cancer. Whereas chemotherapy, so it's given by a, a medical oncologist, it's a whole body treatment. They also call it systemic therapy. So an injection into the veins, so that's going to go everywhere. A pill in the mouth is just going to go everywhere usually given in courses, 
So six courses, you get chemotherapy day one, day eight, and then you get a few weeks off, you repeat the course with time. The issue is that the chemo usually goes after fast growing cells. Uh, and that can be the cancer cells, that can be the normal tissues. And luckily we're into this era now where the, the therapies, the chemos are going right after the cancer cells with causing hardly side, any side effects to the, the normal cells. So uh, as we get better at kind of targeting, uh, we can be more specific in our treatments. So chemo, the side effects differ for each person. Right? You really can't predict it. Each chemo has a different set of side effects. Each person can tolerate those uh, chemotherapy differently. And the physician, because they're given in courses, you get a course chemotherapy, see how you do. The physician can uh, kind of adjust that treatment with time. But essentially, the you know, chemotherapy for the most part can cause whole body side effects. So fatigue, because you're losing lots of normal cells. Nausea, if it's more aggressive. The hairs are growing more quickly, so the hair, there can be hair loss. There can be low blood counts. The lining of the mouth and gut can be affected. So I'm just, not every chemotherapy causes all of these. I'm just giving you an idea that it's the faster growing cells that can have the side effects. Uh, and I told you the targeted therapies are getting better. I'm a radiation specialist. I want to take you through radiation because some people have never even seen what a radiation machine looks like. Um, so it's, it's this kind of x-ray, it's this kind of wave, high energy wave that can penetrate through the tissue and kill off cancer cells. It's usually given externally with a machine. The machine's like a, ch a chest x-ray machine that's going to aim the radiation into the body. Can be given internally in different ways, like prostate cancer seeds. Uh, and usually causes side effects to the area where the radiation is focused. You're going to hear lots of different words. Protons, IMRT, stereotactic, stereosurgery. It's all lots of language to say we're going to try to focus the radiation just in that area and really try to spare the surrounding normal tissue. So lots of fancy technology that allows us to decrease the side effects for the same chance of cure and sterilization. So that's typically a radiation machine. You can see, it, I mean, it doesn't come out as orange in there. It's invisible and it kind of skims across the tissue in this situation. Radiation, like a wave, penetrates through the tissue, can hit the, the nucleus, the words and sentences within the cell to cause so much damage there that the cell can't um, perform or, or live. Whereas chemotherapy kind of diffuses, kind of percolates through that tissue, can have targets within the, the plasma or can actually have targets within the, the words and sentences, which is the DNA. Um, so if you get enough mistakes, the cells can't divide and they essentially die off. Whereas hormone treatments, if you can think about again, uh, like for instance breast cancer, probably the majority of breast cancers have this little uh, receptor on the outside edge called the estrogen receptor. It means that the estrogen that's in females' bodies can actually feed those cells. So the hormone treatment kind of blocks the normal estrogen that's there from feeding any cancer cells. And then the cancer cells kind of die off because of that. Prostate cancer, same idea. Testosterone feeds prostate cancer cells. The hormone therapy is to take the testosterone out of the system and you starve the cells and get 99.9% .9 kill rate because the cells don't have their testosterone. And so by adding that to a curative regimen, you're actually increasing the cure rates, killing off that last cancer cell. But it does have side effects like um, hot flushes, for instance, men lose their sexual drive and so on. Okay, so radiation, I want to take you through just to the, what you would see if you had to go through radiotherapy. So first consultation is the decision, the explanation, and then the radiation oncologist is going to get you ready, going to set you up, kind of simulate you. If you had a head and neck cancer, you'd have to be in perfectly still with this kind of mask over your face or a brain tumor. You'd have a, a mask that holds your head in place. That's a shell or a mask. Uh, in uh, breast cancer, for instance, this is called markings or simulation. This woman has her arms up. She's on a little breast board there to keep her in exactly the same position each day. And then they take a CAT scan. So they're taking a CAT scan of your body so they can individualize the radiation plan to focus exactly where they want the radiation to go. We use tattoos, these little freckle sized tattoos on the skin to line up the person, make sure they're in the exact same position 
as on the CAT scan as on the uh, treatment machine itself. So it's a freckle size tattoo. You can see this woman like three or four tattoos across the upper aspect of the breast area there. It's given as a little uh, needle. The next point is this idea of contouring. So we have the CAT scan. Now we're going to outline in every slice exactly where we want the radiation to go. We're going to outline the, the normal tissues where we don't want the radiation to go. And then the dosimetrist is the person who helps design the plan for your situation exactly. Arrange which way the beams are coming in, how much radiation from each direction. And ultimately it creates a plan. On the top left here it's as if you've been cut right through your chest here, so the heart is in the middle, and then there's obviously the breast tissue, and the colored area is the distribution of radiation. So the radiation is skimming through there. Yes, it's touching a little bit of the, the lung here, but not hitting the heart. Um, and you can see in the different views, is kind of <coughs> cutting this way. You can see this kind of darkish area, that's where the surgery was done, that's called the seroma. And so we want to make sure the radiation gets into that area as well. So that's a distribution of radiation. And then on the day-to-day, -day, for instance, women would have you know, three and a half weeks or five weeks of radiation, you know, five days per week, ten minutes per day would be the typical routine. And what happens is they go into this treatment unit, they lie in the bed here, and they use lasers from the walls to touch onto the tattoo points. So the woman is exactly in the same position that she was at the time of the markings itself and then they'll rotate this machine around to replicate what the plan says to do. And essentially radiation comes out of the head of this machine and goes into the patient and can rotate in different directions and so on. The person who gets radiation has to be in the room by themselves by that from probably five to ten minutes. Uh, it has to stay perfectly still, they can breathe normally. And the therapists are in a console looking in, they can see in a video, they can talk to that person, but essentially they're turning on the machine uh, each day. And there's just another example of the machine shooting radiation across the breast tissue. In modern radiotherapy, it's pretty amazing how we can aim beams in lots and lots of different directions to really focus the radiation. For this situation, it was a cancer spread to the part of the brain there. It's aiming in different spots and really focusing, making a, a true difference in their outcome there. Okay, so that finishes kind of classic medical system, you know, what happens for you. I want, you, I want to take back a bigger step to say, well, how can you give yourself the best chance of um, you know, getting better and healing and, and recovering? And I see it as a multi-layered process. Part of it is, just in the first level, is understanding what's happening, getting that information, and then there's a whole set of skills that go into getting the best care from the medical system. And then there's the empowerment piece, kind of body, mind, and spirit, remembering what's most important in your life. So I'll take you through that. It's just general advice. There's no right or wrong uh, here. Um, you know, we're all different. I would say get the information, but also trust your gut. And ultimately, the strategies and what's most important to you will, will change with time. You know what, diagnosis, you're going to want that information to make the best care. Uh, and follow up, you may want to do more of the empowerment piece around the body and so on. So the first level is very, very important level, which is understanding what's happening. So you want to be able to speak the language of the medical system. You can feel more empowered with that. And you'll get better care ultimately, because you'll be able to have that conversation. <coughs> Information also can empower in the kind of non-medical ways that I'm talking about here. The issue though is that some people try to get too much information, they um, you know, stay up too late at night going to the internet and comparing onto chat rooms and it can be very, very tiring. And so if you're getting tired or if the information that you're learning from the internet is really conflicting with what your physician is telling you, then that's a point where you might want to cut back. But ultimately I want you to get to the point where you have that trust in the system that you're getting the best medical care and you're doing what you need to do and then you need to kind of let go of the rest, right? You can't control everything, do what you can do and, uh, and go from there. So understanding cancer in the medical system, so ultimately you're preparing yourself for that interaction with your nurse and physician. They understand your scenario, your, the, the unique features of your cancer better than essentially anybody else. And so they want to give you the best medical advice. 
And so you do that by going to the library. Sometimes they have uh, libraries at the cancer centers or different um, national websites, for instance, the US. There are lots of different not-for-profits. So the, for instance, prostate cancer would have a, a national prostate organization in the States or Canada that would have good uh, information. And I like the not-for-profits because they're not trying to sell you something. Um, and then ultimately, you're preparing you're advocating for yourself, you understand what the medical system has to offer you, and you are asking for clarification when it doesn't feel right, and even a second opinion if need be. So just walking into that visit with your doctor, you want to create a concise summary of your symptoms, have your medications, allergies. So you've come in prepared there. Write down your questions beforehand because oftentimes people feel quite nervous talking with their physician for the first time and so they can refer to the questions uh, there. Highly, highly recommend that you bring somebody with you, right? Because if you can't concentrate, you know, you're stressed out, it's better to have somebody else who's writing it down or, you know, creating a recording of the, of the session. And I also highly recommend that you create a file so every report, every consultation, every blood test, I think you should have captured in some file there. The reason being is that the medical system can kind of misplace or it can be slow to kind of get that information. And if you have that information, it can speed things along uh, there. And you have a legal right to your own medical file. It's the takeaway. When you're actually in the physician's office, I think it's important just to be honest and open. They can't help you unless you're really tell them what you're most interested in. The other idea is this idea of mindfulness. If the physician is starting to talk in baffle gab and it's really hard to understand what's happening, recognize that point, be able to say something like, I'm sorry, I don't quite understand. Can you repeat in simpler language, for instance? Uh, oftentimes, the physician will talk to you first, they'll examine you, and then they'll give you a blurb about what they think is happening and what, they sh what you should do next. Usually that will answer about 80% of your questions. And at that point, you can actually go to them and say, can you just answer these um, last couple of questions. Take notes or record or decide who's going to do that. And then this is critically important. Find out what to expect. What's your responsibility? If there's a side effect from the treatment, what side, what side effect is it? How bad does it have to be before I do something about it? And what do I need to do? Right? So that's your responsibility. Right? Because if you're at home suffering and you don't tell your physicians what's happening, they can't help you. So please, this, you know, you know, talk and, and ask and, and don't be shy about getting good care there. After the doctor's visit, um, I say again, keep your journal. Um, you can bring in multiple family members because some of the stress of it is, you know, you go in and chat with your physician and then your family member is saying, well, what happened? What, you know, what did he say? What, what can we do? Um, and so the other thing you could do, bring in your cell phone into that consultation or into that visit. And when this is the time where they're going to explain what they think is happening, what they're going to do, you know, call that loved one or call more than one loved one and have them listen in on the cell phone at the exact same time. Right, because it makes it much easier for you to pass it along. I'd also say that it's, the, it's your attitude to say you are the most important person in the room. It's not your physician. It's not your physician's ego. They're there to actually serve you. That's what the medical system is meant for. And so if you can keep that in mind, and so therefore you're willing to speak up and say, I'm not quite sure what's happening, or can you explain that again? It's about you and your care, so believe in yourself. Uh, if you're, um, you know, having troubles kind of connecting, sometimes a family member can, can help uh, mediate and do the talking. Uh, if you're walking away from an appointment and not kind of knowing what's happening, call, ask for an appointment, chat with the nurse. The nurses know 99.9% .9 of what the physicians know. Oftentimes they can answer that question that can really make you feel better. You are entitled to a second opinion. Yes, there can be cost with that. How do you do that? You can ask the nurse of the physician you're seeing or uh, ask your family doctor to send a second consult. But it's really it's at that point where you really don't trust your physician. The physicians follow kind of international guidelines and so you know, typically you are getting the right physical care at least. Okay, there are lots of other aspects to the medical system that we often don't realize. Uh, and if you don't ask about it, you're not going to know. 
right? So I always say, ask an expert. And I, one, of, one of the experts, for instance, is a nutritionist. I think almost every person who has a cancer diagnosis should go chat with a nutritionist, find out what they, you know, what they can offer in terms of advice and so on, and can really make a difference in your life. But if you're running into particular problems like swelling of the arm, go see somebody. Social work is there. If you don't ask, you're not going to, uh, you're not going to know. It's normal, first of all, to have a kind of life-threatening situation. Uh, oftentimes, it's life-threatening, and um, uh, you know, kind of a shattering of what's happening in your world and what the implications are and what you're going to go through. So it's just, first of all, it is normal to feel isolated and alone. It's normal to feel upset and scared, uh, and I think it's bad just to talk about it. Find some wise person in your life who can just listen and hear you out. What I've seen is that the kind of the moods come up and down. Often at the end of the treatment is when a lot of that stress and emotional fallout comes out. It's kind of going home and like, what do I do now? Um, there's no right way. Find the right person. Things will change with time and be kind. I guess one of the things I want to kind of prime you towards is when would you say, uh oh, this, this is a real problem, I need some extra help to help with, with my emotional life. And obviously if you're running into a major depression and really can't see a way out from a, an emotional perspective, that would be an indication. If you're withdrawing, you can't enjoy life at all, you, know, like you don't like your, you know, hang out with your grandkids anymore, then I think that would be a reason why you'd want to get some help. Can't sleep, can't decide, uh, brings up terrible memories, they're all cues to say, Go see somebody. It's not uh, a weakness to, to make a good decision like that. So how do you do it? Talk to your oncologist or nurse. Talk to your family physician. Just say, I'm having a really difficult time. Is there somebody I can talk to? Even an hour with a specialist often can make a huge difference. I, I do strongly endorse support groups uh, here. Um, and I know Palace has got lots of great programming where you can connect with other people and not feel so isolated and lonely and kind of learn those skills and network and figure out how to make the best out of it. So it does definitely uh, improve people's moods and perspectives and you can, you can learn a lot more. Just I'll briefly touch around this idea of the complementary medicine. It's this idea of uh, a treatment that's outside of the kind of the classic medicine. Uh, alternative is uh, means that you're foregoing that, uh, foregoing the, the proven treatment. I don't recommend that at all. Complementary more and more we've been able to embrace. Uh, but if you're taking something by mouth or IV, then tell your physician what you're doing because there could be an interaction between the complementary medicine and the, uh, the cancer treatment. Um, essentially conventional medicine, we've had these breakthroughs and the mortality rates are decreasing with time because of the scientific method and lots of clinical trials and so on. And this idea of what's the risk, what's the benefits, what's the data. Um, whereas complementary medicine, you know, depending on what the, what the promise is, if the promise is to improve quality of life, then you can simply go for it. But if the promise is, you know, this is definitely going to cure you or some other false claim, then I think you have to be a bit more wary. The toxicities aren't as well known, although that's certainly changing. And just be aware of extreme diets. It's just not very, um, it's not a very, very good move because you want your body to be able to recover uh, as, as uh, uh, well. So, like buying a car or anything else, any other major decision in your life, you want to actually be smart about it. Use your kind of logical mind. Ask that practitioner, you know, what's the quality of their education? Uh, and then really it's down to what's the benefit of the treatment? You know, is it documented? Is this just a few case series or their experience? Or is there a large pool of uh, patients that were treated in a particular way and their outcome was measured in a particular way? And what's the toxicity? And what's the interaction? And so essentially you're asking that same question of benefit versus risk and the, obviously the cost. Okay, so the last part of this is around empowerment and empowering your body. And I'd say two things. If, if your particular type of cancer, there are certain uh, lifestyle habits that help prevent that type of cancer, then you want to do that if you get diagnosed. So if you know that exercise decreases the risk of breast cancer, then you want to exercise if you get a breast cancer diagnosis. Or if you know that your um, risk uh, increases your risk of your type of cancer, for instance, red meat 
and prostate cancer, then you'd want to actually avoid red meat if you get a prostate cancer diagnosis. Because even if the cells in your body are, you know, are cancer cells in your body and they're kind of turning over at a certain slow rate, you don't want to cause more damage to those cells and turn them, the slow growing cells into fast growing cells. Right, so you can live much longer if your cancer doesn't continue to mutate and get more aggressive with time. So around that. Oops. What's the number one thing you can do to, uh, to uh, empower your body, feel better, stronger, sleep better, blah, blah, blah. You know. How much? How much exercise do you have to do in a, in a week or something like that? What's the guideline? Is it walking the dog? I don't know. How, how kind of short a breath need you get? You need to have a little sweat in the brow. And how many minutes of that? Anybody want to offer? 30 minutes. Yes, well done. It's about 30 minutes a day. They say 150 minutes per week overall, but uh, I really do think that's the number one means of actually getting stronger within your body. Um, Obviously, you need to slowly build up your endurance. I would say see an expert as well. But if you're relatively healthy, you want to get yourself up to that kind of uh, 30 minutes per, per day. But even people who are in the last few months of their life, stretching, getting up, you know, using those muscles actually improves function in lots of different ways. And it releases the kind of the happy hormones uh, as exercise. Okay, uh, so this is actually you're gonna get a point for each healthy activity. And I'm gonna say if, if last week, within the last seven days, you got three times 30 minutes or 90 minutes, you get a point. Something where you kind of bring out a sweat in your brow. All right, so just mark that in your mind. I'll, I'll come back to this. What's healthy habit number two? Diet. Yes, yes, diet. Number, and what are some of the elements of a healthy diet? Water, fruits and vegetables. Fruit. Yeah. What are your, some of the things you're avoiding? Sugar. Sugar. <laughs> yeah. yeah, exactly. So those are the things that are there. So fruits and vegetables, low fat. You want to individualize. I mean, and then again, you're looking for those opportunities where. Um, uh, you know, if you're running into a particular problem, you're underweight or maybe you're overweight or nausea and vomiting, constipation, some treatments affecting the, uh, the nutrition system, you actually want to go see an expert. And I thought when I first kind of got that general nutrition advice about 20 years ago, I thought it was such fluffy advice, but I've actually come to appreciate that you do actually want to get nutrients from multiple food groups, probably with each meal, because the micronutrients interact with each other and can kind of empower the body. So decreased fat, um, fiber, fluids, and maintaining the healthy weights there. So, um, and what's a supplement? What's a vitamin that you might want to take? Vitamin D, it, probably in the winter time especially, right? and depending on how much uh, you get. So vitamin D, 1,000 to 2,000 international units per day. Okay, yesterday, within your 24 hours, if you got five to 10 servings of fruits and vegetables, you get a point, all right? Point number two, have a think about it. Healthy habit number three is maintaining a reasonable weight and being kind with yourself as you work uh, with this as well. So maintaining a reasonable weight. And I'll just put up the, the BMI system here. So you find your height in inches and then you scroll across and you find your weight in pounds and then you go up to the top and you can see in the green, yellow and red numbers what your uh, body mass index is. And so probably the kind of 22 to 24 is the, the optimal for uh, cancer prevention. But let's say if you're between 24 and 26, you get a point today. So green zone, yellow zone, you get a point. All right, oops, that's the next <laughs> healthy habit there. What are some of the ideas that will help you get a good night's sleep? Not that you can force yourself to, but you can actually facilitate that. Set the clock. Set the clock. Your clock in your head. Set your clock as a routine, for instance. You're getting to bed at the same time. What else helps with a healthy night's sleep? Exercise. 
Dark and also yes. Yeah, so dark room, the same area. I say you get the lights dimmer and dimmer and dimmer. You're kind of reproducing our evolutionary history of you know the sunlight going down and so on. Routine. Do you know what we talked about a nap? Na having a nap. There's actually some really good data that if you have a short nap during the day, it improves the quality of your sleep at night and you feel more rested the next morning. So before 5 p.m., even you no know, 10, 15 minutes can actually make you feel better. Lots of ways the kind of brain rejigs itself through uh, through sleep. What do you wake up at uh, 3 a.m. and can't? Guiding meditation. Yes, because you can relax, stay in the dark. Go ahead. One question: If a person sleeps four hours, mm -hmm. he gets up four hours later on. Does that is that the same impact as eight? The, um, the, uh, the total sleep time is important, but even 90 seconds of bright light in the middle of the night will suppress melatonin and other healthy hormones that are released during sleep. And so that's why I prefer eye patches at nighttime, it kind of the dark blinds, it's the dark room again, and then doing the kind of blind person's walk to the bathroom at night. So keeping the, keeping the dark there. So there's, there's a whole you know, issue around sleep hygiene, right? Okay, so, and that has actually been, you know, women who work at night have a higher risk of breast cancer, essentially. Or the stewards that travel north-south on the airplanes have less risk than those who travel east-west. Okay, last night, I'm being kind today, if you got seven plus hours of sleep, you get a point. <laughs> Some people shake their heads, no, I can't do it, it doesn't work. Okay, last one is practicing relaxation actually changes, changes how the brain works. And your brain will continue to grow and adapt throughout your lifetime. Um, and there are lots of different ways to kind of, it doesn't necessarily have to be like a body scanner or meditation. Sometimes do the moving exercise, a Tai Chi or Qi Gong actually changes um, the kind of physiology within the brain. So you can feel better, happier, uh, decreases all sorts of other risks. So I'll ask you that one. Even within the last week or even the last month, <coughs> if you did some exercise, we can get that chattering mind to kind of settle down, you're going to get a, a point for that one. Okay, so it's out of five, right? So you, if you have all five healthy habits, you get five out of five. So exercise, eating your fruits and vegetables, maintaining a reasonable weight, kind of green yellow zone, sleep last night, and practice something. Okay, so what was your number? Oh, it's, sorry, it's out, <laughs> out of 10. It's actually out of five. So if you got five, you're lying. <laughs> number four, you can't count. Three, that's actually pretty good. Number two, at least you're honest. Welcome to Bermuda, we'll uh, get you an immigration. Go straight home, you're a danger. <laughs> So to reduce your risk, big picture, biggest picture of all cancers, what are the things you can do to decrease the risk and you and your family members of not getting a cancer diagnosis? Eat healthily. Eat healthily. Eating healthily, exercising. exercising, avoiding what toxins? Smoke, alcohol, exercise, good. Oops. And so that kind of, the, the diet that we got, high in fruits and vegetables, more plant-based, Limiting alcohol, vitamin D, avoiding sunburns, all that kind of motherhood stuff. Let's do that together. Decrease the incidence. Help your family members, right? So you want to teach this. You want to infiltrate it into your kids as well. Uh, and I said a third risk if we did that. Lastly, I just want to talk about the last idea here is that a loved one may get a cancer diagnosis. And I can tell you that being that family member, being that loved one who does not have the cancer diagnosis is as stressful as the person who gets it, right? And yet, we kind of ignore that person. We ignore the, the family member who doesn't have it. And the other thing that's very normal is that the family member who doesn't have the cancer diagnosis tries to put on a brave face. They want to be positive. They don't want to let the person with the diagnosis see them hurting because they say, oh, then it's just making it worse for them. And I want to try to reverse this right now. And I want to say that the best thing to do is actually to be open and honest. 
because everybody can see that you're hurting. And for you to say, oh, I'm not hurting, is just a lie. It's an obvious lie. And if you can be open and honest, then it allows the person with a cancer diagnosis to be your friend and your you know, partner, et cetera, et cetera, to help you. And it brings the relationship much tighter together. And that's better than trying to be the tough guy. Um, the second piece of advice I'd say is take the cue from the person with the diagnosis. They're the kind of the leader. And you can ask them, do you want me to be the information specialist? Do you want me to go to appointments with you? Do you want me to do some research with you? Or do you want me to tell the family members? You know, allow the person with a cancer diagnosis to lead how they want this whole kind of situation to, um, to, to proceed. And lastly, you can still enjoy yourself. You can still, you know, connect and you don't have to feel guilty about having laughs with, with that person, even in the most difficult situations. Okay. I think that's it. Uh, thanks to the PALS team for selling some books out there uh, for me. The book that we're selling is um, essentially every second chapter is the teachings from a weekend retreat. So it, it covers a lot of this ground that I've talked about, but it really goes into more of the psychological, spiritual aspects of it. So it's a whole set of kind of healing skills that is much further beyond than what I've given on this talk. And then every other chapter as well is um, uh, people who've had a cancer diagnosis and the story of their lives and so on. It's, it's um, quite a touching um, book. And there's also a DVD there that you can learn some Qigong, which I had done. Just a little bit of that kind of movement there. So it's a video of that. It's a video of some very gentle yoga and a video of um, meditation. So $20 each for that. So do me that favor, buy a book. I have to carry it back to Canada if you don't buy it. So please. Um, I think that's it. And I guess I'll just go with, um, I'll just go with questions from there. So thank you very much for your attention, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Could you just tell us a little bit about what you're going to be doing on Saturday? Because we do have a sure. seminar, yeah. which is the old day. Yes, so, sure, so there's a Skills for Healing seminar on Saturday at PALS. It's going from 9 to about 4. And during that day, I'll go into kind of the deeper stuff. You've kind of got the information here, and now we actually learn how to decrease the stress levels, how to reframe difficult thoughts and emotions, how to learn the relaxation techniques that can really make you feel a lot better during this. Um, and so there's a little bit of different ways of therapy of kind of accessing your kind of resilience. And so it's very practical, very hands-on. If you had a cancer diagnosis at any time in your life, you can join, you can bring a loved one along with you, essentially. I guess we're making it free now, I guess it's free. Uh, it's limited to 25. 25 people max. We've got 10 already. Oh, good. Out, so we only have 15 spots. 15 spots to go, so yeah. Anyways, it'll be lovely to have you. I mean, I've done this lots of times. We also offer weekend retreats, but this day long actually goes deep and goes, uh, you know, it's really appreciated, so. Okay, to questions as well, any questions? Go ahead. Tell me, in Europe there's a big uh, feeling of uh, hyperbaric oxygen mm -hmm. and moving the blood out and, and re-oxygenating it. Uh, how does that compare with uh, uh, chemotherapy? So, uh, the idea with either chemotherapy or any other therapy, there has to be some type of differential between killing cancer cells and sparing normal cells. Uh, and I don't think hyperbaric oxygen actually kills cancer cells because, I mean, it's, it would just kind of feed, feed them. I can't see how that would work. Now, hyperbaric oxygen is very good in situations in which there's a, a scar or some type of healing area that doesn't have enough blood supply. And by getting the oxygen into that scar, it actually allows the tissue to heal itself. I think, I think the major thing there is that they take the blood out of your body, ah. push it through oxygen, ah. and then bring it back in. It's mm. quite hyperbaric, hyperbaric. Sure, but there's oxygen, put it into the bloodstream, into yeah. The bloodstream, and it, uh, the oxygen, uh, they found out, kills the cancer cells. Mm. They, they yeah. Yeah, but it, again, it's back to, you really have to kill off the last cancer cell before that's actually going to work. And then you also have to weigh that against, you know, what's the damage to the normal cells. So I don't have any experience on that. I can just talk to you from principle around it. Yeah, good question. Thank you. Yeah. Go ahead. Um, talking about <coughs> sorry, exercise, yes. healthy diet, yes. 
maintain a reasonable weight, sleep, relaxation. All of that is lifestyle. Yes. My question is, how much numbers now is the risk of cancer reduced by the person who lives this way? Yeah. So that's that, that's that one in three. You know, as a society, if we could do those things, I mean, the relaxation doesn't necessarily prevent cancer, but the other ones actually have an influence on whether we develop cancer or not. If we did those things, we, one third of the cancer diagnosis wouldn't be there. Yeah, so it's, it's a huge difference. And not only that, people would feel better. So physically, I'm talking about, the first thing I said was, maximize your chance to cure feel better and allow your brain to function better. If you do those things, those five that I'm talking about, that actually gives you the means to not only decrease your risk of the cancer coming back, but actually to feel better and have your brain function better. So one in three decrease in, uh, in incidence. Yep. That's huge. It is huge. And that's why you want to teach that to your grandkids so it's part of their lives mm -hmm. from now on. Yeah. Yeah. Go ahead. Guidelines for mammograms after age 70, and is there a screening test for pancreatic cancer and ovarian cancer? Yeah, so it's a great question around guidelines. So I think what we're doing in Nova Scotia is mammograms until age 75, but if the person has, so it's every two years till age 75, but if the person has great longevity within the family, like your parents live to 95 or 100, it's probably worth doing a few more mammograms there. When the life expectancy gets less than about 10 years, that's the point where you can probably cut back on the screening. Now pancreatic cancer, just for everybody to say, so the pancreas is this organ that's at the back of the abdomen, and so it's, it's very difficult. There's no kind of blood test that can show it in time, and it would be very expensive to try to do scans on everybody. So really, to try to screen for pancreatic cancer is difficult. And it's the same thing with ovarian cancer as well. There is a, a particular blood test that does pick up ovarian cancer, but again, the rate of ovarian cancer is so low, and again, that test has to be so abnormal before you'd actually see something. So it's been very difficult to produce a screening test for ovarian cancer. Yeah. It's kind of it's too internal and not enough. It, 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 it presents too late in the game. It, the, the cancer's already spread by the time the person's getting symptoms. Is, Generally speaking, it's not for everybody, but generally speaking. Yeah? Is it true that we're all born with, um, with um, cancer cells in our body and that a major stress in your life can trigger that and just shoot it off? Right, yeah. So I guess everybody heard that idea. Now, stress and causing cancer, it's been very, very difficult to prove that. And I'm not going to argue with a particular individual who says, you know, I was perfectly well and then I went through this major divorce and a year later I got breast cancer. If they believe that, I'm, you know, uh, we'll work with the psychological issues and so on. But really, what's happened is that, you know, we all are suffering kind of those major stressful events. And if you go back kind of retrospectively, there doesn't seem to be an association between the major stressful event and cancer, you know, as on a population basis. So it, it's really hard to prove that one. In terms of somebody who has a cancer diagnosis and then has stress in their life, again, it doesn't seem like stress by itself is a major um, uh, decrease in longevity. But if a person is depressed, uh, that definitely decreases longevity. So stress doesn't seem, because the stress hormones also give us energy uh, and kind of prime, prime the system to kind of fight as well. So it's that kind of balancing act there. So it's really hard to prove or answer that question. Yeah. It's a great question though. Yeah. Could you read about PET scans versus X-rays? Yeah. Okay, so the question is about a PET scan versus, for instance, a CAT scan. A PET scan injects uh, like a sugar into your bloodstream and the sugar has some type of radioactivity on it. And then wherever the cells are growing and turning over faster, it's, it's sucking the sugar into it and so it kind of lights up. And so the PET scan generally is more accurate 
than a CAT scan because it's actually looking at the, the physiology, the kind of how active the cells are. So it kind of lights up. Now the brain will light up quite brightly and the urine system can light up quite brightly, et cetera, et cetera. But there are certain situations in which a PET scan is a good idea uh, in a cancer diagnosis. It's not for everybody or every situation. Yeah. BCG for bladder cancer? For, for cancer. just gen cancer in general, yeah. yeah I'm, I'm, not a, I'm not a chemotherapy expert, expert, so I should probably hold off. I have to be more specific. I don't think it's, I mean, we don't use it in multiple types of cancers, so it'd have to be a specific situation in which we'd actually use that. <coughs> so, sorry. Yeah. How is radiation used for payment? For pain? Yeah, so it's a great question. So you think of um, like a lump, uh, I'll describe a situation, maybe prostate cancer, the cancer cells get into the bone, it lands on the shoulder, and it's starting to eat away at the bone a little bit, and that can be very, very painful. Now, radiation works really well against prostate cancer, breast cancer, lots of different cancers. The radiation is aimed at the shoulder area, and then it kills off the cancer cells there, and the bone starts to heal itself. And when the cancer was eating away at the bone, it was also um, irritating the nerves there and causing the pain. So as the lump goes away, then the pain gets much better. And radiation works really well 80% of the time in terms of improving pain. And it can be as simple as a single treatment of radiation or even five days of radiation in a row to that area and you have a very high chance of be getting out of pain. So, yeah. It's great questions, guys. I really appreciate that. Yeah, go ahead. Nowadays, research has been, I don't know if it's proved about the cell phones and computers and all the other factors. Right. Yeah, so I don't know for certain. What I think, though, is that the cell phone energy is such a low energy that it, it gets absorbed within the first millimeter of the skin. So I don't think the cell phone or Wi Fi or anything like that actually goes deep enough in to actually cause a change in the cells. Now, mammograms, for instance, use a higher energy, and you could argue too many mammograms at too young an age might um, you know, predispose the person, but the benefit of the mammogram in picking up a cancer is way bigger than that, that extra risk there. So, and so, for instance, when I treat breast cancer, and I'm using very, very high doses of, of radiation to the breast, I'm probably putting the person at about a one in 5,000 risk of a cancer caused by the radiation itself. But the benefits of the radiation are way bigger than, than that. So, yeah, it's a, it's a very good question. Yeah. Yeah. Do you think we should discuss immune therapy more? Yeah. Um, again, I'm not an expert on immune therapy, but this idea that you get the immune system or the white cells or the antibodies <laughs> to identify the cancer cells as foreign and kind of attack them and kill them. And in some cancers like melanoma, maybe some of the lymphomas, the blood cancers, it can be useful. But again, it's that principle of you still have to kill off the last cancer cell before you had a real success. And what's the effect on the normal cells as well? So, I mean, it's a reason why you want to decrease your stress levels and practice relaxation and so on so that your immune system is working better. But, um, uh, you know, there are no kind of home runs in that world yet that I know about. Yeah. Yeah. Go ahead. This, uh several different uh, natural substances which are complementary mm. to um, chemotherapy and uh, do you for instance know anything about uh, turmeric is one mm -hmm. yeah antioxidant physicians up in Boston uh, yeah. recommend there is also uh, grape seed mm -hmm. extract, mm -hmm. which actually is supposed to kill Mm. Mm. How do you feel the complementary systems working with uh, Yeah. Cancer? No, so you're asking about some of these kind of um, antioxidants that have had kind of some proven effects in the test tube, for instance. And I think that 
you know, when you're going through, like, let's say you get a, um, like a colon cancer and you have to go through chemotherapy. So typically the chemotherapy would last for six months and it's probably not worth kind of jeopardizing using an antioxidant at the time of chemotherapy. So what the antioxidants do is to kind of mop up the damaging chemicals that are in the bloodstream. And so you don't want that antioxidant to be uh, interfering with chemotherapy. Once the chemotherapy is done though, I think these kind of lifestyle and healthy diet decisions are a great idea because it can kind of mop up some of the damaging substances that could be contributing to the cancers. So, but really, I mean, 20 years ago, I would have felt quite uncomfortable talking about the complementary therapies, but nowadays I know that there have been major trials looking at so many different types of complementary treatments where they're actually studying, you know, one group of patients gets, um, you know, the standard usual stuff, one group of patients gets turmeric or grape seed extract or whatever, and then they compare how they do over time. So I, I know we're not missing out on big, big outcomes because they would actually, if there was a big outcome, they'd actually market that and actually use it as part of standardized medicine. I had the, my friend was had the, it was recommended to mar uh, turmeric because in India where they grow this mm. huge region that there is not one cause of cancer. Mm. So much less, area. yeah, from an epidemiological <laughs> perspective, yeah. I know we're, we're late uh, there. I'm quite happy to stay behind and chat with you and answer further personal questions. So I really do appreciate your attention and the great questions as well. So really, take care. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you.